Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Reinvention Virtual Chat and the Power of Reinvention podcast. I am so excited to be co-hosting today's session with my dear friend, business colleague, and just incredible human, Marvin Epstein. So thank you, Marvin, for being here with me today. Say hello. Ooh, thank you. Um, Marvin made an introduction to me to this extraordinary woman, Andrea Albright, who is with us today, and she is the CEO of Beverly Hills Publishing. I'm going to give you a little bit of her background, but in our conversation today, we're really going to dig a lot deeper than what it says in her bio, because there is a reason she is where she is in life, and with her philosophies and mantras and beliefs and really just the history of where she's been and what she's been doing. It's no wonder that she has built the company that she has today. And I had the pleasure of spending a long leisurely lunch with Andrea and Marvin a couple of weeks back and truly just got to know this incredible human being who I now consider one of my dearest new friends in life, which I just love and adore. And uh, super excited to be sharing a bit of her with everybody today. So whether you're on Facebook Live, whether you're on Zoom, whether you're listening through the podcast, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here. And let me just share a little bit of background with, about Andrea and then we'll move on. Andrea Albright is the founder and CEO of Beverly Hills Publishing, which is a full service, high end luxury publishing, marketing and PR firm, which is disrupting the $100 billion publishing industry. Andrea wrote her first book in 2006 and quickly realized the niche and gap in the marketplace where authors were being underserved by an antiquated process of their traditional publishers. Her unique business strategy, which is putting the author first and creating a direct relationship with each thought leader resulted in her tremendous success, capitalizing on this gap by creating a disruptive approach to the publishing industry. Today, she's an accomplished author of over 20 books and is contributing a contributing writer to Entrepreneur Magazine. To date, she's published over 50 plus authors globally across all industries and verticals, including entrepreneurship, finance, real estate, personal development, renewable energy, medicine, spirituality, investing, and women's inspiration. I actually had a chance to meet a number of those people at an event that she held recently at her fabulous new penthouse suite in Beverly Hills. And it was just such a joy. I had a little giggle as I walked into this penthouse suite and looked out over the balcony at Beverly Hills High School, my alma mater that was sitting there at my, at my viewing pleasure from a, what, 20th plus floor, 30th floor in that building 40 and 40 floor. It was just, just such a joy to be able to look down and kind of go, look where I am now and look where I came from. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of a moment. I had this conversation with a number of people that were there and it was really just a precious and very indelible moment. So Andrea, thank you again for being with us today and for joining us. And before we delve too deeply into this really quickly, I just want to is a dear friend and co-host on the show today. He's a serial entrepreneur himself. He's the co-founder of Karma International, which is an exclusive private member organization dedicated to connecting exceptional and inspirational entrepreneurs like us, both socially and professionally. He is a TED Talk speaker, an author, a philanthropist, and he believes in the power of who you are, not what you do. And that's what makes a difference in the world. He himself wrote a book that was published by Beverly Hills Publishing called Humility Branding. And he is now a managing partner with the Beverly Hills Publishing firm and explains why humility is the key characteristic to inspiring great leadership and experience ha experiencing happiness. So that's a little nugget of who we've got here co-hosting with me today. So Marvin, Andrea, thank you again for having time in this busy holiday season to be a part of this incredible show and conversation. We're here to talk about reinvention and inspiration and book publishing. And I have to just add that I'm thrilled that my editor, Brooke White, is on the show today mm. because... 
she has taken me through the gauntlet of so much of this experience that I have such an appreciation for the art form, <laughs> the pain, the pleasure, and all that goes with what it takes to launch a book. And I'm just really thrilled that you're all here. So thanks. Welcome, welcome. Wow. Yeah, this what an incredible <clears throat> margin. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, Kathy, this is incredible. Um, you know, I know what do they say about the holidays? You know, if you want, you just want your two front teeth. I just wanted to put Kathy and Andrea together. So, I mean, Andrea is, it's like, she's a unicorn. She's a unicorn in business and life, in everything that she does and everything that she influences and everything she builds. And, you know, I want to keep this short because we could all go on and on about the wonderful people that we have. But the one thing I can say about Andrea, and I hope the audience gets the same takeaway is every time I talk to you, you make me understand me better and you make me a better me. And I can only hope for this audience that you make them a better them. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kathy, for having me. Thank you, Marvin, for connecting. I, I've been looking forward to this and I feel like it's already Christmas, <laughs> Christmas morning. Uh, it is. Well, let's delve into this because I love to ask this question. You know, we, we know a lot about already what you're doing today, who you are. We don't know how you got here. And more importantly, one of my favorite questions is, who was little Andrea? Mm -mm. Where did she come from? Were you, what were your aspirations? Did you have any idea with the trajectory that you were on through your teen years, your early twenties, that you would end up here in LA, in Beverly Hills, at the top of a penthouse, running a successful business in publishing, and more importantly, making other people's dreams come true, which I know firsthand, having met many of the authors that you've dealt with. Um, what, what was that early story all about? Oh, I love this question. Thank you, Kathy. Well, I would say I have always been a visionary long before I knew that word. And I have had glimpses of what this reality that I now live in was going to be. I remember being a child and pretending like I was doing business. And of course there were no cell phones or computers, but I would like just had a visual of like, having my pocket and my hands always full of something. And I know now that that was my phone. That was the technology. I was always going to be communicating, creating, creating value. And I was actually one of those children and throughout high school where I always had so much quote unquote potential, but I would get bored very easily. And I found uh, health and biology. I thought I wanted to be a doctor. I went through biology got a pre-med degree and then realized that, you know, that wasn't going to satisfy me. And so I went to get on a, a Spanish degree and started learning another language. I didn't know it at the time, but I was an entrepreneur and I didn't even know that word until I was 28 years old after I had had a nervous breakdown in corporate America. I was successful, I was making money, and everybody was telling me how, how successful I was gonna be, but I wasn't fulfilled. I was bored and I would reach the top of success on their terms, but I wasn't being recognized for my gifts. I wasn't being appreciated. And this was long before the Me Too movement. So I was gonna there was say, a lot it of sounds harassment. like you were ahead. Of, yes, you were dealing with yes. this ahead of a, a time where at least there's a voice that one is encouraged to really right. use when, when they're recognizing this. Yeah. So I started my first company at 26 and I'll never forget the moment where I incorporated the document because we had to go to the registrar's office long before you could do it online. And I filled my name next to who is the CEO. And the minute I wrote my name next to CEO, my entire identity shifted. And I realized in a moment, wow, we're making this all up. I just made myself a CEO and I've been creating businesses on my own ever since. I love that. I so know that feeling. And I have to say, and I've had these accolades having run a company for 33 years. I made myself the president and CEO 33 years ago. And I used to have friends who were climbing that corporate ladder that were, you know, really 
profound C-suite executives at companies, but they were C-suites. They weren't the CEO. They weren't the president. And they were in such awe that at an early age, I was already a CEO and a president. And I think that ability to sort of appoint yourself and then step into those shoes and act accordingly, be accordingly, run a business, grow a business, it's a pretty special and amazing thing to do to be an entrepreneur. So I I recognize that feeling you must have had when you filled out that piece of paper. Yes, thank you. It was a shift and I've been realizing ever since, you know, once you step into it. And I also discovered that I was never going to be as ambitious working for someone else. And now I wake up with passion and joy and enthusiasm and curiosity. And if you are an entrepreneur, if you're just wired that way, you know, I say that you don't choose it, it chose, chooses you and you really have no other alternative. <laughs> Um, so when you have these opportunities, I mean, you know, no great success comes without its hard moments, its challenges, the fear of failure. How did you move through those moments? What was it that enabled you to sort of say, okay, I'm doing this on my own. I don't have partners. I don't have, you know, potentially a whole corporate executive C-suite and board around me necessarily. You might have, depending on the company you were building, But, you know, when you're the CEO of a company, it's your baby and it's your responsibility. How did you move through those challenging moments and times and remind yourself what you were capable of? Well, I've been fortunate to attract two great mentors through my career. And the first mentor had a hundred million dollar company selling information on the internet. And this was back in 2006. And I attracted him as my mentor and he shared with me his business model. And I didn't understand everything at the time, but I just knew I was like, this internet thing is gonna go somewhere. (laughs) And why not devote my five year career instead of going to graduate school, why don't I study the internet? And so that's what I did. I rolled up my sleeve and I, I got really invested in learning marketing and internet marketing and how to create products on the internet. Never in a million years would I have known that I would be part of the social media revolution. So back in 2006, 2007, it was like, what's this thing called YouTube? I was able to create videos on YouTube. And then those videos became on the front page of Google because the content had the most thumbs up. And so those opportunities came because I was willing to take risks. And that is an advantage of being a visionary is you can see into the future, but yet you still don't know how it's going to happen or where it's going to happen from. And so by being able to reach my audience directly, I had very low costs associated with that startup company. I didn't have to have an office. I didn't have to have a team. I mean, I learned how to build my own websites because that's all I had was my time and my energy and my curiosity. And so I'm so grateful for the internet revolution that you could create a business with such low startup capital. Nowhere in the history of business have we ever been able to create product and value and reach an audience the way we can today. Right. And you know, you you are an incredible success story. And I'd be remiss if I didn't address that and, and really how you define success. Like what, what does that really mean to you? I know we all define success in such different ways. And there are so many layers to us as human beings. Um, You know, my definition of success used to be as long as I could be at the dinner table with my two sons on any given business day, if I was in town, that to me was success period, no matter what I was working on, what I was doing, what I was building, Um, where in the realm of life, like what to you, and just given some of the roller coasters and challenges and incredible moments you've been experiencing, what is that definition of success for you? Well, well, I've always been told I'm a dreamer my entire life. Mm -hmm. I'm unrealistic. I'm a dreamer. I'm out of touch with reality. And, you know, flash forward to today, (laughs) 
and now I'm a genius. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's amazing how things have shifted just in the last, I would say, like five years since everything has really exploded. But as we know, you laid the foundation of your success for many, many years internally, long before it ever shows up in the external world. And so my definition of success is Yes, there is money because money is the flow of value being created. It's the lifeblood of business. And the more money you create, the more value you're able to create, the more people you're able to serve. However, that money has to have the highest vibration of integrity. And so that means that the product, the service, my team, the clients, everyone is playing a win-win-win game. And it's a three-prone approach win. It's you're winning, I'm winning, and the collective whole, even the consciousness of the planet and earth itself is winning. And then I look around and I say, okay, this person may have more money or this person more ha have me more accolades or success, but I don't know anyone who has more fun than I do, except maybe you, Kathy. You I don't know. I'm going to run say. for my money. <laughs> you know, I, I'm always about, it's about the people that I work with and the fun quotient of what we're doing. Yeah. And to me, the rest follows. But if you know that you can, you can create that and that's the bar that you set for yourself, that the, that's the criteria. I've always said, you know, if it's gonna be two o'clock in the morning and I'm working on an email or a proposal or a project for a client, I better like them and I better love what I'm working on because then I don't mind what I'm doing at two o'clock in the morning. Like what else, what else could be fun, you right? Exactly. So I and I that's... never would have imagined that that just devotion mm -hmm. to saying, you know what, I want to keep integrity. I'm a health expert as well. So I really understand yeah. the Let's power of Let's talk about that a little bit. Can we, can we talk yeah. about that sort of background that you have in the health area? Because I think it's, it feeds into who you are. Yeah. Well, I wanted to be a doctor. I became fascinated with the human body and the science of biology. And I used to struggle with my body image. I was overweight. I was an addictive yo-yo dieter. And then I discovered self-love and yoga and meditation and nutrition. And there's a whole beautiful holistic lifestyle that I follow today. And though that was my first book. When I first started my business, I really... I wanted to help other women to break out of that bondage of the yo-yo dieting obsession. And that was my first business. And my mentor said, well, if you want to become an expert, if you want to become an authority, you have to write a book. It's one of the most competitive industries in the world. And so I wrote my first book and I was terrified that no one was going to read it except for my mom. And I would look like an idiot and all the things a first author goes through. But I told myself, if I can help one person with their health, then it's worth it. And I put that book out there and then it went on to create thousands of success stories from people all around the world. And people would write to me and say, you've saved my life. I was going to kill myself until I found your book. And now I love my body. I love myself. I have a whole new life. And so it was these messages that I kept getting back. And that's a passion I have for taking complex ideas like science and biology and losing fat, gaining energy. And I make them in a cartoon simplistic way and I make it fun so that you become motivated and, and you get engaged and then you see the results and then it becomes a fun experience. And so that's my background. I've written over 20 books on health and fitness and I've been on the cover of Women's Health and Fitness Magazine, which is the number one fitness magazine in the world. And they didn't only put me on the cover, they also interviewed me as a thought leader because they said, your books are evolving the conversation of women's health. You are disrupting the paradigm. And so that's what a thought leader does. And I've had the great fortune of being able to influence and affect millions of people with my philosophy around simplistic health. I love that. And the, thank you for sharing that. That was really something that I wanted you to be able to touch on. And I think the notion and, and Marvin, I'd love you to step in here um, since you have really been one of those who's had the pleasure of working with Andrea and her group at Beverly Hills Publishing as a thought leader, as someone who has an idea, a concept that they want to share. Your book, Humility Branding, came out, what, two years ago, maybe? 
mm-hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what was that journey like for you? And, you know, just given what Beverly Hills Publishing is doing for other thought leaders and business leaders, um, you know, how's, how was that process and that journey for you, from your experience? You know, it's interesting <clears throat> when I first started working with Andrea and she saw my TED talk and told me, are you ready to write a book? And, you know, I'll condense the conversation, but basically I told her, I said, funny, you should say that. I've been working on a book. And she said, how long? And I said, 12 years. And so, and she didn't laugh, which meant I was more the norm than the exception to the rule. She said, well, send me your writing sample. So I sent her the writing sample. She came back and said, you know, that's really cute, but that's not the book you're going to write. So when somebody makes a statement like that, and when you're dealing with somewhat alpha males and very successful females in both ends, you really have to play at their level. And when you make a statement that's that bold saying, but that's not the book you're gonna write, the risk is somebody says, I'm hanging up the phone. Her way of looking at it is, I know what's best for you and I'm gonna make you the best. And with all her clients, I mean, I've seen this over and over again. And how many, how many publishers get their clients into contributing writers for Forbes and for Entrepreneur Magazine and being able to do not only the publishing side, but also the marketing, the promotion and the PR side. And yeah. it's literally taught me an industry that I always thought was kind of like a, I call it hocus pocus. And now I realize you just have to focus. And she, <laughs> and she is truly the epitome of you focus, we're gonna make this work. And you've seen it, you know, firsthand when you came to one of the events and you've obviously had a chance to meet her. But I think, you know, her manifestation of saying you have to play to win always, I think is a really, really high bar. And one thing I just want her to touch on is um, when she won the Wheel of Fortune, which I just want her to expound a little bit, but her goal was to win it. Forget about getting on the show. That was a given. Right. She said she's going to win it. And I think that attitude is something that the audience really needs to understand, especially in this day and age. So what was that experience like for you? And, and you know, we all think that we're going in something with, into something with the intention of winning it, but maybe not so much. Maybe we're really not giving it that level of energy that we should be to create that success or that accomplishment. So what's your take on that? Well, I write about this in my first book on entrepreneurship and Mm -hmm. winning Wheel of Fortune was the first time that I created something. I manifested it and I believed in myself a hundred percent without a single doubt. And I actually have a new term that I'm using. I call it strategic manifestation because it's not just like sitting on a cloud and in Lotus and saying, oh, I'm going to draw it to me. You have to be strategic about it. Anything that is worth winning is going to be a game that is more complex than the average person could ever play, which is why so few people would be able to win it, right? That's the value of winning an extraordinary game. And so you want to look at it as like a chess game. You know, there's one move and then another move and then another move. And it's also the power of practice. So when I was 16 years old, I watched the show with my dad. And I had a difficult childhood. My parents divorced and I was really unhappy, but that was the time that we bonded. And I remember saying at 16, I said, I'm going to win Wheel of Fortune someday. You can really win some money on that show. And I remember the moment I said it. And then from then on, it was like, there was never a doubt in my mind. I was going to win Wheel of Fortune. And so throughout high school and college, I would tell people, I'm going to win Wheel of Fortune. And people laughed at me and they made fun of me. But then every now and then someone would be like, oh, I'll, I'll play with you because I was practicing and I had the game on my laptop. And so it's not just declaring it and then just waiting for it to right. happen. Right. You've got to be ready yeah. because when the wheel mobile came to town, I was ready. You I had been, ready. I had played the game and I'd practiced it. That's amazing. And it's such a great, great statement about what we do and don't do. So, you know, when I said that before that, you know, we had, we say we have intention, but are we acting accordingly? Are we doing the things that are going to set us up for success? 
Are we willing to put in the time, the energy, the hours, the dedication, the commitment, do the research, do the work, or are we just talking about it? And just, you know, almost delusionally talking ourselves into something we believe. So I think that is the difference. I talk all the time as we, you know, go through my power tools in my book and various exercises that I say, take a pen to paper. Don't just read it in the book and go, oh yeah, that's great. I'm going to do that. But if you put pen to paper and you actually commit and you take the time and you create those moments for yourself where you are carving out your plan, your strategy, your goals, you're really committing at a cellular level to what your intention is, that's game changing. That is going to redefine how the results show up because you're actually creating those new results. And it feels like you have done so much of that um, in your life to create the successes that you have, to build the business that you have today. Let's talk a moment about the publishing industry as a whole. I mean, it really is. I feel like, you know, you've done some things that are somewhat disruptive in the industry. (laughs) Um, You know, I self-published my book. I had my incredible editor who came from such a great background, shepherded me through every move above and beyond and just gave me such an incredible education as I went through the journey. A lot of people don't have Brooke White in their lives, unfortunately for them, but many have discovered you and what you're doing and how you're building this business. And let's talk about sort of old guard, new guard and what you're doing and why you think it's the right time in the publishing business for not just yours, but maybe other companies trying to do what you're doing in this space. Yes. Well, the publishing industry is an outdated dinosaur. They haven't evolved their strategy or their approach to anything for really maybe over a hundred years. And they're huge, you know, multi-billion dollar companies. So it's like getting the Titanic to shift away from the iceberg. Even if they know something's happening, it's not like they're able to even make changes. And what happens is unfortunately, the authors are the ones who are left suffering and struggling. And the statistics show for, according to Forbes, over a million books are published every year and less than 1% of those books make an impact in the market. So I know what it is and what it means to be an author. I'm standing for an author revolution. And the fact that there are a million books that are not making a difference and making an impact. I mean, the heart and the soul of that author being shared with the world, how much insight and vision and opportunities are we missing out on? Because that author doesn't have the marketing, the promotion, the PR, and everything that you need in order for a book to become successful. Because if you ask anyone, the book is just the beginning. You now need to get the book out there. And my approach, instead of creating a book, publishing a book, and then trying to market it, the problem with that is that there's no market who wants to buy it. And so we do all the marketing first. And that's my unique intellectual property that makes me different, that makes me different than any other publisher out there is I'm a marketing firm and a publishing firm. And I do all the marketing first. We know the market, we know the strategy of the market and we know where, what the market is searching for. And so then when we publish the book in as little as 90 days, we don't wait years because the market is evolving faster than ever. So we need to capture the market. We need to be ahead of the evolution of the market. And we publish quickly and efficiently and accurately. And we evolve the conversation of the market. And so that's why the books become so successful. That's fantastic. And I know that um, many business people are using this even as a marketing initiative, a marketing program to grow and build their businesses. So do you find that you have more clients that are writing just because they want to be authors and they want to be published? Or is it that more of the clients are actually coming to you saying, I have a real estate business, I have a financial business. I know if I become a respected author and thought leader and I'm out there marketing my business, it will be good for the company. So are you finding that there's kind of it's weighted on sort of one more than the other? Well, I say books are the new commercial. Mm -hmm. 
So no one watches commercials anymore, but when there is a book that is perfectly targeted to you and a problem or an obstacle you are facing in your life, when you receive that book, you give it your undivided attention, even if it's for just a moment. So we have an opportunity to market and to capture an audience. And then once they start reading the book, now they are invested on their time, in their terms, in their comfort of their own home, or in their relaxed environment. And you have an opportunity to build a relationship unlike any other medium in the entire world. Books are very, very special. And so books are a business tool. They are a branding tool. They are a investment tool. They are a Hollywood distribution tool. If you want to make your turn your life story into a TV or a film or a movie, books are very, very special because they are their own form of communication and their, their own special world. So I specialize in thought leadership books people who are disrupting their industries, evolving the conversation. And a thought leadership book is a combination of a biography. We don't really read a lot of biographies anymore. It's just not a big genre. But if you can get a biography combined with a how-to, a how-to launch a podcast, a how-to start a marketing company. Now you have a thought leader. So that's what I specialize in. Yeah, now it's fantastic. It's a, it's a, a fascinating model as a marketer, brander, PR person, author, all of the above. I think that's why you and I connected so quickly, why Marvin brought us together so quickly. Um, there's such an appreciation for the way you're viewing the, the um, industry as a whole. And when we can disrupt an industry, I mean, look, self-publishing was the first level of disruption and that ability. I mean, I looked at that and when Brooke and I were debating where do I take all of this incredible content that we were streamlining into this great book and 30 anecdotes and 26 power tools and incredible quotes from great people and that really were a part of what I wanted to do to inspire and motivate and give people some sense of what's possible in their life. You know, the question of is, do I need to wait around for some agent and some publisher to sort of deem what I have to say of value? No, I know what I have to say is of value. I'm ready to take everything I've ever created and get that out into the world. The fact that I own a marketing company and I'm able to do that for myself with my incredible team is, you know, just a step ahead of what most people, you know, don't have. But I was fortunate in that I was able to do that in the last year and a half. Um, but I think it's incredible to be able to take that whole ecosystem and be able to deliver that and help people really find their path forward in this space. So it's really amazing. So what's the funnest part of what you do? What do you love the most? in, oh in the process. Oh, well, look, you know, from one marketing geek to another, you know, <laughs> the whole thing is amazing from the very beginning, the original conversations of, you know, every author who comes to me and I take them through my process of, instead of writing from your perspective, flip it and look from the perspective of your audience. Most people have never even had that conversation. They've never even thought to do that. And so that aha awakening of like, wow, I was going to write my book from my perspective. And it's like, well, this is why a million books don't go anywhere. It's because you're not thinking about what, what is the audience thinking about? How are they perceiving it? And so when someone switches that perspective, I not only believe that I'm contributing to them as an author. I believe they're, I'm contributing to them as a person, as a business owner, as a visionary, as a, a thought leader. And just that one, you know, that's, it's the most powerful shift you can ever have in your perspective and in your consciousness. So I think that's my favorite part. I, I think, I think the other thing that, you know, and we've talked about this many times is be a thought leader, not a thought copier. And, and I'd love for you to kind of share what that means because there's a ton of thought copiers out there. Yes, uh, that is a funny, that's a quote I have on my website. Thank you, Marvin. I love when you quote me. So there's so many thought copiers out there and all they're doing is taking ideas that they've heard or read and then they just spin it for themselves. And if they're great at marketing, they can put a nice banner on it or put a nice show together and then they're giving it off as it's their own thought leadership. But when you are a thought leader, it feels different 
there's a resonance of truth that is coming from you where you know that you are sharing it, not because you're a facade or trying to be something or trying to come off as something, but it's literally that this message has chosen you and you are in service of this message. And so it's humility to use Marvin's term. You have to be completely humble because you're not going to always be liked. You're not going to always be accepted. In fact, that's what evolutionary disruption is about, is about disrupting the status quo. And so true thought leaders are not here to just appease everybody and to just copy ideas that are in the trend or you know getting a lot of traction on social media. Thought leaders are truly here to get you to wake up and to rewire your brain. And I use the power of words to do that. Other people use different modalities, but it's the same desire, which is the desire to just be in service of the message that has chosen you. So speaking of that message, you have a book that you're working on right now. Um, Authority Catalyst, I believe is the title, working title, title or def definitive title. That is the definitive title. And can you give us a glimpse of what that will be about and when you expect that to come out? Yes. So Authority Catalyst is my book that I have broken down the strategy, my formula, and a simple step-by-step -step process that you can use to be seen and branded as the authority in your industry. And the reason why being an authority is so powerful is because we no longer have trust in our leaders you know, if you have royal blood or if you're a politician or even if you're the chief of a tribe, we used to have this following for them just because of their position. Well, in today's world, because of the internet and social media, we now have all of these lights that have been turned on behind the scenes. And so humanity is looking for leaders. We are starving for leadership, true authentic leadership. And if you are being called to be an authority, like I said, the message has chosen you and you know that it's time for you to step forward right. to lead, then that authority position is the most powerful position you can have. Have. That's where PR media wants to talk to you. The minute you become a published author, you're seen as an authority. That's where the word authority comes from. It comes from the word author. And so stepping up and saying, I'm willing to share this, not just for my own journey, my own hero's journey, but to share and support others in humanity. That's the most powerful position. Everyone wants to work with the authority. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, I think the words imposter syndrome come up for, for not me personally, but in conversation and the thought that many people go through that challenge of, you know, am I really an authority? I, I can say that in all, in all candor, after running a business for 33 years and being, you know, the CEO of my own company and having an expertise and building companies and accelerating their growth and building brands and doing some pretty profound things in my 30 plus years in business, when I wrote a book and suddenly became the author mm -hmm. of Reinvent Your Life, What Are You Waiting For? And became this new title. And I became that authority on the topic of reinvention and building the life that you dream of and want and that you're entitled to have that. There was always this moment and we hear so many people you know, trying to get over that hurdle of not feeling like an imposter when they're stepping into what that new role is in their life. Even that moment that you put on that paper, I'm the CEO of my new company. You know, you had to kind of like step into those shoes and say, okay, I'm going to own this. And not everybody can do that very easily. Just because you're good at something, I always say, just because you know how to make a meatball does not mean you should be running a restaurant. So I think there's, you know, always this really interesting dichotomy within us to want to share our voice, to want to be that person of authority, but we question whether or not we are being an imposter by trying that on and owning that. And, you know, I don't know if you have some thoughts about that. I am a huge proponent of dispelling the fact that this even exists and that we need to just step in and own it, which I think is very much what you're saying. 
Yes. I mean, a, a phrase I hate is fake it until you make it. I mean, because that's implying that you're faking something along your path. And like I said before, I've seen my vision for decades. Just because the rest of the world didn't see it does not mean that it didn't exist. And so I wasn't faking it. I was on a process of becoming it. In fact, you could even argue I was already it. I've yes. always been it. You can never not be it. And so this imposter syndrome, I believe is just you validating yourself from external circumstances or situations instead of tapping in to what I say is the most important thing for a thought leader and an authority, which is your vision, which is your knowingness of why you are here and what you are here to create and to share. I don't believe that any authority sits around and is like, okay, how can I convince people that I'm authority? I think that they are called to be it. And they know that if I don't share this message, this message will die with me. Absolutely. And there is a responsibility. I mean, the fact, look, I know with every virtual chat, I think today is number, hold on, number 112. Wow. Virtual chats That's today. amazing, Kathy. Thank you. And just, you know, that and 52, I think we're on number 52 of the podcast. And when you think of every conversation and every moment that we have been able to affect and impact people's lives, that every person that has bought my book, every story, every interview that I've done has affected somebody's life in some way that is a beautiful thing to know that you're doing. Um, I don't want to be greedy and hog all of your time. I've got one more really fun question and Marvin probably has another one too. I'm going to go first. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you could have a dinner party and have anybody sitting at that table, dead or alive, three or four people that you would just love to maybe, you know, break bread, have a glass of wine with, who would, who would those people be? Oh my goodness. Well, I've always wanted to publish Madonna's book. She's wow. my number one. I grew up with Madonna and she was the first woman who declared you can be smart and sexy. Every other woman had to pick one or the other. And she was the first one who said, you know what? I'm not going to choose. And I just thank her for that. I mean, Oh, love I can't it. imagine how different my yeah. entire experience would be. So I would love to have dinner with her. I would also love to have dinner with the author of The Alchemist, Paulo Coelho. Uh, uh, yes. And I had the, the gift of reading that book in Spanish. And it's even mm -hmm. more beautiful in his original language. Wow. And just a um, talk about a visionary and a huh? thought leader with the power of books and it yeah. continues to inspire and just I would love to just learn and figure out like how did you get that vision beautiful you know God, because I want to now are you making you. me want to reread the book it was so long ago probably 20 years ago that I read oh, that it's a great reread yeah too. Um, I love that. Anybody else? One other person? Anybody jump well, to mind? I got to throw in Marvin, Oprah. who's like raising of his hand. Of course. Hands, but... <laughs> Kathy and Marvin, I would have to have you there. I mean, I got to throw in Oprah too. Yeah. Oprah, you know, for her media skills to be able to capture hundreds of millions of people across all mediums and modalities and the most influential person probably that's ever lived. Yeah. Just an incredible yeah. human being too. Beautiful. Marvin, any last questions before we turn it over to our uh, guests? To yeah, I have, a, I have a question that I think the audience will appreciate. And that is, I think both Kathy and Andrea have, not only are they authors and entrepreneurs and incredible authorities in a lot of things that they do, but they're actually good managers of their companies. And Kathy's proof is having her team on this and being part of all our productions, Andrea, has worked remotely with teams of people all over the world way before COVID said, do you want to work from home? But she created something that I call Wordisms. And one of her mantras for her team is, there are no INGs. And I think for all the entrepreneurs out there, this will change your life when you hear what this means. Yes, this is how I run my virtual team. And I have been for over 15 years. So this, COVID thing was no disruption in my business at all. We, we've scaled and grown. So when 
they're on their own terms, on their own time, on their own environment. The communication is, is super important, but it's also about the culture and building the culture. And just because you're not in the same space, you still have a culture of camaraderie, participation, and self-ownership and self-reliance. And every day that they work for the company, they send a daily update. And it's very simple. What were the results that you created today? So no story, no background, just what were the results? And if someone is confused about what is a result, I say, just don't use a word that has ING on it. So working on, preparing for, delivering, et cetera. It's, I finished the PowerPoint. I uploaded the graphic. It's done. If it's an ING, that means it's still in the, it's in the story of wow. becoming something. And so I think like a computer actually, when I run my business, I just look at, is it black or white? Is it on or off? And that way you don't get emotional in, into anything. And it can yeah. be just very clear. And it also gives them a sense of win. And I always say, give me your th top three wins, not just your top results, but what did you win today? And they're able to really look at, wow, look at what I accomplished. Because if you are always in the process of doing something, then you never feel that sense of self-ownership and accomplishment. So no INGs. <laughs> Fascinating. We could do an entire session just on that. Wow. <laughs> it's like drop mic. So great place to conclude my podcast. Please don't go anywhere. We're going to do a, a little chat and Q&A with everybody. I want to thank you for those who are on the podcast audience for listening in today. Happy holidays. And please check out the Reinvention Exchange and also go to andreaalbright.com for some incredible background and access to all that Andrea is up to and a special promotional giveaway that she is actually offering on this show, which I will briefly tell you about right now. She is actually giving, and we're going to put this in the chat if it's not already in there as well, a um, $100,000 valued handbook of information on strategy and checklist. So you can sign up at andreaalbright.com to actually win that. So just a little, a little nugget for those in the podcast listening audience, and I'm going to sign that part off. So thank you everybody and happy reinventing. Okay. We're still here. And I want to open this up to anybody who has questions, thoughts, comments, anything I might have missed in the chat. I was just so riveted and paying attention to the conversation. So either raise your hand, unmute your mic, the uh, it's time, <laughs> time to go there and ask questions. So Shelly, let's start with you. Wonderful. Thank you, Andrea. Oh my gosh, your story is so inspiring. I love your energy and your whole outlook. I am really, really connected to your whole idea of marketing from the outside in, you know, listening. Isn't that great? Listening to what people want. So with everything that's been going on in the last two years, our world is literally flipped upside down. What are you hearing that people are looking for in what do they want to learn more about? What do they want to read about? How has that shifted from potentially some of the content you published prior to the zaniness of 2020? <laughs> yes, amazing question. And it's such a pleasure to meet you as well. I love people who are in this book industry because we, we have a passion for it and we also know how crazy it is, but we do it because we love it. And the things that the market are searching for and looking for are leadership our authentic leadership more than ever. What this disruption in our world global economy and our paradigm of how do you work, what's real, what's not real, we are looking for solutions, we're looking for answers from people who we trust. Mm -hmm. And so this is why I say now is the best time for you to publish your book. Now is the time where true leaders emerge. That's why I, you know, I'm publishing my book. I published a book during the pandemic and 
true leadership steps forward when the rest of humanity is retreating. And this is actually where you will see who are the true visionaries, who are the true leaders, because everyone else is scrambling. Whereas the visionaries, we've seen this coming. We knew that there was a disruption that was going to happen. Of course, we didn't know it was going to be a global pandemic that was going to take out in the entire global economy. But guess what? 2020, here we are. And so what we're looking for is true authentic solutions from people who are thriving and working. And that's what thought leaders are here to do is, yes, we're succeeding, but also we're here to share. We're here to give back to others. And so if you were writing your book before the pandemic, you know, it's out of date. This is also why we need to publish quickly. We can't sit on our books for 10, 15, or even two years anymore. We need to publish. We need to share our ideas. We need to share our solutions so that we can be of service because the world is searching for true authentic leaders that they can follow. Thank you so much. Kathy, I know Paul, who's going to be one of our guests in 2022, has a question. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Very Hi. enjoyable. Thank great you. content. So my question is about the book and the audience and who would read it. I, I agree being an authority and having that as a calling card is important. And we'll do it through speeches. Some people do it through technical articles. If a book is actually published, is the intent that the audience is going to find it and read it? Or is it really just to open up the door to be positioned as a leader through other means? I always start with the purpose of the book. So I ask the author, I say, what do you want the book to do? Yes, there are some people who want to become global authorities on the world stage. So they want to be speakers, they want to get in major media press, they want to do global speaking tours, all of that. Then there are other people who say, you know what, I want to bring investors into my, into my business. So I have had clients who one book has brought them a million dollar investor because the book in the hands of the right person, now they read the story, they engage and they say, wow, I wanna give you a million dollars. So it's about the strategy from the very beginning. It's about what do you want your book to do? And that's where the author's dreams and vision and goals and purpose is where you want to start. Because if it's not aligned with the purpose of the author, then they're gonna get bored, distracted. This is actually where a lot of writer's block comes from is because they didn't tap into really what is this book going to be of service for my highest vision. And so we start with that of the book can be anything. Remember the book is just a commercial. The book is here to amplify you as the authority. And so whether it's you or your business or a movement, it's that's the clarity that we get from the very beginning. You know, I love that you said that, Andrea, because I had been writing for years and I was sort of on a mission to write all about reinvention. I interviewed hundreds of people. I was passionate about the topic and very deliberate about how I felt about people's entitlement to live their lives on their terms and the way they want. As an entrepreneur for 30 plus years, I, it's the way I've always lived. So I was like, of course, anybody can like do what they want. It wasn't until one of my friends asked me one day when I was kind of in that stuck writer's block mode. And she said, why? are you writing this book? And I literally for three days could not answer that question. I never stopped to think about why I was writing the book. I was just doing it because I was doing it and I was loving it. And I just, when I set out to do something, I just do it. I didn't stop to think, why am I doing this? The moment I answered that question to myself first, and then I called her up and I said, I have the answer, but that was a catalyst moment. And from there, the floodgates just like flew open. I found my brook, I found my path forward and it was like game over, done. So I just love that you touched on that because I think if you don't understand your purpose and why you're doing it, and I talk about this in the book, you just, if you don't understand your why in anything that you're doing in life, you won't have what you need when the times are tough, when you're bored with it, when you're challenged by it, you don't have the energy, you don't have the momentum. When you remember your why, it anchors you and it propels you at the same time. And it's Absolutely. so critical. And it attracts the people to fulfill and serve that purpose as well. 
Yeah. So it becomes an amplifier. Exactly. Um, I want to address, Irina has a question. How do you want to ask it out loud? She's asking how to finish a, is that a three quarters book? <laughs> is that your three quarters uh, of the way yes, through it? Yes. Tell us what you mean by that. <laughs> yeah. So hi everyone. So thank you so much for all this beauty and all this knowledge. So basically I have three unfinished books. Aha. Uh -huh. And as you guys said, I, okay, this is the purpose. I had multiple purposes to start writing them at, at different times. And they're all like now at three quarters, some of them at the half. And I don't know like how to finish them. Like how to, because I know about how to write the structure of the book, how to write the chapters, what is the intention, what is the purpose. But then it's like, how do you find these endings? Like how do you how do you bring them to this conclusion? Any writers here? Because gee, Andrea, I'm, have you heard so, that question before? <laughs> I was going to say, Marvin, can you relate to this? You know, gee, to, yeah. <laughs> well, so if you can't find an ending, I would challenge you at the beginning. So you didn't have a beginning. You didn't have the clarity and the purpose of the beginning. So I'll give you my strategy that I start every book with, and I call it my magic money hook. So it's a magic money hook because you have to hook the audience. You have to get them to pause and say, what? If they don't lean in and say, what? You haven't hooked them. It's a psychological hook. Otherwise you're just bombarding a marketing message over them and it turns to white noise. They don't even hear it in their psychology or in their mind. So it's a money hook because you want them to reach into their pocket and buy your book, right? It's the exchange of value, exchange of money. And it's magic because it's going to work like magic. And you're going to find it for every market, every purpose. It's always there. And once I have the magic money hook, I always go and get the URL of the book which they're always available. I mean, the URLs that I come up with, people are like, how is that available? It's because of my process I go through with the magic money hook from the very beginning. So the magic money hook, you start with your purpose, just like Kathy was saying, why are you doing this? What is the purpose of the book? Do you want the book to get you on the Today Show? Do you want the book to bring in clients? Do you wanna have a TED talk? Do you wanna be an authority so you can raise your rates? really get clear. Is this a fulfillment of a childhood dream? Write out all the purpose of what is this book going to fulfill? And then go into the market. Who do you want to attract with this message? Who is the perfect person that you want to serve? And if you say everybody, you're saying nobody because the internet has caused everybody to fragment off into their own little niches and everybody wants exactly aligned to what's I want. So you have to create a character, an avatar of who is the market you want to attract. Now that you know who you're talking to, you're not going to go into writer's block. It's only when you're talking to yourself and you're in a monologue that you get stuck. It's just like you and I are in a dialogue right now. When I know my audience, all I do is I'm like, okay, what's the question? What's, what are they, right. what problems are they having? So that marketing with your purpose combined, that's going to be the magic hook. And when you have that clarity, now you fill in your content to serve the market. So basically Irina, what you're saying, yeah. I just me. want to say one thing. One of the things that Andrea talks about with all her clients is being ready and being prepared. And believe me, it's a tough submission process to become one of her clients. And she's pretty hard and fast about those rules. And there's a whole, I guess you could say process that she's created to make sure you are ready and are prepared. Um, if I may, sorry, because I know we're past the hour and I wanna be respectful of everybody's time, but Tim, I see you have a question which I would love you to be able to address. So please. Well, buenas noches from Barcelona. It's, ah, uh, buenas noches. Buenas noches. 1230 in, 1230 in oh, the morning. Well, oh, well, thank um, you for staying with us. So I get to go to bed with all of you. This is wonderful. Brilliant. <laughs> Best proposal I've had all day. Oh, my Lord. Well, Mar this has been really and Don't worry, I'm giving you the wake-up call at 10 o'clock. Uh, I'm talking to you in six hours. Yeah. <laughs> it's worth it. Yeah, I don't know if I can go to sleep right now, actually, after this, this, this chat. Although I did have a thought. Do you think the CEO of Kellogg's was a serial entrepreneur? Yeah. I, I, uh, I, 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 I like know. it. 
<laughs> it's probably an old one, but I just was thinking of it. But you know, the word in, in, in Marvin, I, I met Marvin a few weeks ago and he has turned me on to Andrea and I'm really excited to, to learn more about, about you and, and, and work with you. But the word disruptive has come up quite a bit in this conversation. Um, and disruptive has so many different connotations. You know, it can be, as, as you said, Andre. I mean, it's um, what we went through with COVID. It, it disrupted the economy and the world. And But if you can just talk just a little bit about how you use disruptive in a positive way for attention, I know Ted, that's not the right mm -hmm. word, but just, you know, for to, to, to draw notice to what you, your movement, um, your product, your brand. Absolutely, I love this question. I absolutely use disruption for attention. I love attention. I love to get people to wake up and, you know, people call it different things. It's like a psychological hook where you, a pattern interrupts the day-to-day -day status quo. People zone out. Most people, are, well, we're all in a state of hypnosis all the time. It's just, what are you hypnotizing yourself to? And so what disruption does is it breaks a pattern. It causes you to, for one moment, pause, and now the whole mind is open. And now you're able to receive a new message. So I ex absolutely use disruption for the positive. You can use it for negative, but I choose to use it for positive. And so I've studied with NLP and personal development. And so I really understand like psychology of how to grab an audience's attention, even if it's for a moment. And now you can infuse a solution. You can build a relationship. You can provide value. But if the mind is still distracted or in a state of numbness, then they'll never even receive your message. So whether we're looking at disrupting an industry or even disrupting a conversation or how somebody shows up the very first time you meet somebody, that's an opportunity for a disruption. It is the beginning of the journey. I also have a yoga background. So in yoga, we practice breaking down. That's actually why we go to yoga is we put ourselves in postures that cause the body to break down muscle fibers. And, you know, this whole process of like death in the Eastern culture is not seen as a negative. They, that's seen as the beginning of the transformative like the process, yeah. the beginning, because it cut the death. And then on the other side of it is the rebirth and the yeah. growth. And so I see disruption as the beginning of evolution. I believe it's actually evolutionary process. And so that's why I'm so excited about it. And that's why I use it in all my books and all my content and all my business models because the other side of it is now a complete blank slate of openness. That's I feel it. I feel it. Thank you. And yes, thank you. Muchos you know, gracias. Nice Muchos gracias. De nada. <laughs> Por supuesto. Andrea, I feel like with every converse, every question and every moment that we go deeper into this, we're opening more and more um, just pathways to who you are and you what have you're no sharing idea. is so powerful and so beautiful. And, you know, sorry guys, but I'm having cocktails with her next Monday night. So I get, I get a whole <laughs> lot more of, so of her, <laughs> but it's, you know, it's such a joy to have you in this conversation, to be contributing your thoughts, your thought leadership, um, just your energy, who you are in, you know, what is just such a beautiful time. And I think that Brooke said it so beautifully, what a way to close out such a powerful year of reinvention, virtual chats, and, you know, this community that we have built. And I know people will be tuning in because it'll be on the website and on the podcast. And, I'm so grateful for this. I'm so grateful for all of you for being here and for the chance for us to just share, open our hearts, our minds, our energy. You know, we're on the precipice of a new year. We're in such a better place than we were for the last two years in so many ways. So I think we're all just so grateful for that. I want to thank you all for staying a little bit later today, for being a part of the reinvention virtual chat community and Andrea Marvin love you guys and love this so grateful hey this is my number seven show and seven's my lucky number and Ooh. believe me looking at this screen i'm quite a lucky man no. oh. Ditto. 
Likewise. And this Paul, we're coming for you, dude. <laughs> yes. <laughs> This Andrea. has been so much fun. What a pleasure. Congratulations on your incredible show, Kathy. You are an inspiration to me. And I'm so honored that I get to call you a friend. And we get to, this is just the beginning of our just journey. Just the beginning. Just the beginning. <laughs> and Marvin, no question. big love to you forever. My partner and my supporter. And I've known you for 10 years and we've been through so many evolutions together. And I know that the best is just beginning. So it only I'm took me honored. nine and a half years and nine months to earn your trust, respect, <laughs> and desire to work with me. <laughs> uh, everybody, if we don't connect again, happy holidays. Can't wait to see you all back here in early January. Look out for the newsletters if you're not already signed up. Feel free to, and be sure to go to andreaalbright.com and check out her incredible and very, very generous offer. Um, I mean, I signed up last night. I was like, I'm, I'm checking this out for sure. But, you know, our, our minds are going to meld a whole lot more and I'm really excited for what's to come. So happy reinventing everybody and have a beautiful week, a beautiful holiday. Dare greatly. Enjoy life. Have fun. Thanks Thank for everybody you, coming on. Thank you. Oh, Thanks for everyone. Great question. Everybody else. I'll call oh, you. Nice to be Bye. 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 <laughs>